6 30 p.m. Roll call, please. Who's this? Here. Vice Mayor Banther is absent. Excuse Commissioner Siever. Here. Commissioner Kikta. Here. Commissioner Carr. Here. Tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Melody Kitt from the Crystal Beach Community Church. If you please stand <laughs> and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight, oh God. We come before you thanking you for life's blessings. We ask that you be with this gathering tonight as decisions are made as a whole for what's best for the community of Tarpon Springs. Give insight, discernment, and wisdom, I pray, this night. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight. <clears throat> we'll begin our meeting with the public comments of the items that will not be discussed tonight. If you have any comments, please come forward, state your name and your address for the record, and you'll be given four minutes. Sure. Good evening. My name is Dave Ellis. I live at 579 Lakewood Drive in Oldsmar. I am running for circuit court judge. There is an election coming up November 6th, in case anybody didn't know. Judicial elections are normally held during the primary, which was August 28th. This is a runoff, so it is the only judicial election that is left. People don't generally care about judicial elections or pay much attention to them. Mm -hmm. I would tell people that you really should. Circuit court judges serve over all of Pinellas and Pasco County, serve for six-year terms, and unless challenged, um, don't have to run for re-election, and although it's a six-year term, it is really, for most circuit court judges here in our circuit, it is something that they do for the remainder of their career. 
what judges do affects thousands and thousands and thousands of people, not just people that are in the courtroom, but all of us in the community as well. And certainly if you're ever in a courtroom, you're gonna really care who your judge is. So uh, please vote, please make informed choices. This ballot is almost four pages long. It is really, really long. The constitutional amendments are difficult. So please do your homework before you go. Otherwise, you will find it to be a very difficult process. There are multiple items in each amendment. If you try to sit and read through three pages of that when you're voting, um, it's going to be a difficult thing to do. So please be informed. Please vote. Again, my name's Dave Ellis. I'm running for circuit court judge. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Hear none, thank you very much. The item number one on agenda is the Ohi Day, and I will read the proclamation. The city of Tarpa Springs, Florida, proclamation, whereas Ohi Day, October 28, 2018, commemorates the events of Greece in 1940, which the brave Hellenic nation boldly stood together for liberty and freedom for all for all costs against their allies. And whereas the historic statement Ohi, a reference to the uh, defined no in Greek, play a pivotal role in the ultimate victory. Whereas Ohi Day is an aspiration to those who cherish democracy and freedom. And whereas the Greeks faithfully met their obligation with courage, self-sacrifice, determination, and dedication. And whereas the city of Tarpa Springs celebrates Ohi Day in honor of the noble heroes, men and women, who fought for the free Greek nation. And now, therefore, I, Chris Alahuzis, by virtue of the authority divesting in me, as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs, do hereby proclaim October 28, 2018, as the Ohi Day. This is always not here, so we're going to mail that proclamation. Are there any uh, commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Here, none. Item number two is, an, is another proclamation. Commissioner Carr will read the proclamation of Florida City Government Week. City of Tarpon Springs, Florida proclamation. Whereas the City of Tarpon Springs will be joining cities throughout the state in celebrating Florida City Government Week. And whereas city government is the government closest to most citizens and the one with the most direct daily impact upon its residents. And whereas Florida City Government Week, sponsored by the Florida League of Cities, is a celebration that raises awareness about the importance of municipal government and its daily impact on residents. The League is the official organization of the municipal governments in Florida, and whereas this year's theme, My City, I'm Proud of It, raises awareness of how a city operates and the services it provides, and whereas city government officials and employees share the responsibility to pass along the understanding of public services and their benefits. Now therefore, I, Commissioner Jacob Carr, by the virtue of the authority vested in the mayor of, of the city of Tarpon Springs, do hereby proclaim the week of October 22nd through 28th, 2018 as Florida City Government Week. And we hope you will join us in the celebration and learn more about your city and how it operates for you. Thank you. This that is going to be mailed. mailed. Yeah. Are there any commission comments on this item? You know, are there any public comments? You know, thank you. We are now going to the presentations. Item number three, auto plan, audit, <coughs> car, rigs, and egram internal auditors. Eric? He's coming. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Ron Herring, Finance Director. We have uh, Rob Broline, partner with the firm of Carr Riggs Ingram, to present the RO plant audit. On switch helps. <laughs> Good evening. So <clears throat> this uh, audit 
dealt, deals dealt with the its contract compliance of the reverse osmosis treatment facility. And I want to draw your attention to the executive summary um, right there. And a couple things to highlight. One is that um, in terms of the limitation here, when we got into the project, and that second paragraph there describes the fact that the type of contract, the type of delivery method was a design um, lump sum build, design build lump sum contract, which means all the costs through the negotiation process were fixed. And so there were, certain, there were only certain components that were really subject to audit and subject to contract compliance. And we listed those seven categories there which were subject to our testing. And then you see the, the risk assessment we go through in terms of de determining what risk rating we gave to those. I also want to emphasize where it says contract compliance testing summary right before the table there, that we didn't find any actual exceptions to the contract. So those observations aren't exceptions, they're really observations related to process improvements going forward. And so if you look at the next, the next page there, you kind of have that nice picture there. Every, those green checks are, green's good. Everything checked out well and it, it, the process is in place worked well and we didn't find any exceptions at all in that process in, in our contract compliance review. These observations then deal, one deals with project work changes. What that deals with is there weren't any actual work orders or change orders as you know, you probably know from this project, nothing actually increased the project. The project came in as originally contracted for, uh, but there were uh, value engineering changes that were able and, and tax savings uh, that were used to offset other changes. And so overall the project didn't increase stay within budget, within the agreed upon original fixed price, but we wanted to see going forward uh, documentation around uh, those types of changes, getting uh, proper approvals and a certain thresholds we felt if those if it went above a certain threshold, then that would be, should be bumped up to um, even the commission level if those changes were over a certain threshold uh, relative to the work. So that's the first observation we, we noted. The second one had to do with uh, the department did a good analysis and doing a cost benefit analysis and deciding which type of contract delivery method to go with before deciding to go with design build lump sum. Uh, we put an appendix to this report just to kind of lay out there's others, other things to consider when doing that cost benefit analysis and so we suggested going forward on future projects you might also do a kind of a fuller cost analysis that takes into account other factors. Um, one of those being a, a delivery method is called cost reimbursement. That's where all the costs then are subject to audit and are just more transparent um, in that approach. Background information here, you guys are very familiar with this project and I know that um, you can read, I'm sure you've read through that. Um, here on this page, uh, for your information, uh, we get into more detail, it's a more detailed uh, presentation of the specific steps that we performed up in those seven areas that I noted earlier that we we, that we tested contract compliance for for this project. And then this is just, this just drills down, um, just elaborates a little bit further on the observation, gives a little more context to the project work changes I spoke of. And then we have three specific recommendations. One is putting in a formal document, a, pro, review, process, a review process to kind of make sure those changes are, are analyzed more fully uh, beyond the department level. Um, and again, B is, is suggesting that if it gets to be a certain threshold that you would determine through your own, your own uh, procurement levels, whether or not those adjustments uh, um, would, would um, be necessary to go before the commission and to get their review and approval. And then we suggest uh, to incorporate our A and B to actually uh, put into place actual processes or policies and procedures to accomplish them. And I talked about this. This just lays out uh, the kind of the pros and cons we're talking about of doing that additional analysis and determining which contract uh, method delivery to use. And the rest of it is the, the appendix. Take any questions that you might have at this time. Uh, I'd just like to thank you for the presentation. I would thank you for the uh, recommendations that you've given us. Uh, the uh, design build lump sum, is that something common that you see as a project? Yeah, so it varies. It really depends upon the nature and complexity of the project. And I think that there was a lot of, as you all know, there was a, a pretty long history here of, of looking at this project and planning and designing it. And I think um, when you have that kind of um, due diligence, um, I think it's, then I think uh, management becomes more comfortable in going from 
you know, to go ahead and negotiate it as a, as a lump sum bid. So yeah, we see, we see, it just depends on the nature of the project, but we see design, build, lump sum is, is, is not uncommon, um, especially this type of construction. Um, uh, the most common in vertical construction, like you're doing buildings per se, what's very common there would be a construction manager at risk type project, um, which could also be a design build. The design build is when you essentially are putting together the architect and the contractor together as one entity and they work together. That's the design build team. As opposed to say, a construction manager at risk, you'll have the architect that sort of acts independently and direct reports to you as the owner. And then the contractor has a separate agreement and reports, re reports directly to you as the owner as, you know, of the project. And so there's, there's, it just depends on the nature of the project. Thank you. I'm very happy with the, uh, with the project. I think our team did an excellent job. I just wanted to hear from you as well. Thank sure, you. Sure. Uh, any commission comments? Commission Kick. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And, and um, I echo um, the mayor. Uh, the team did an excellent job on this project and um, it was very successful and it just it's an amazing project for our community so um, I just want to make sure that the recommendation that we'll be implementing mark their uh, recommendation yes okay and again thank you so much sure you're welcome no I just want to thank you Mr. Kohler uh, thanks mayor uh, I think this confirms that Bob is the man um, in our uh, <laughs> projects department. He was the PM, I think, over this project. So um, thank you for all your hard work. It's glad that um, it just confirms that you obviously do a lot of dedication to the city um, and everything that you did for the water plant. This is obviously done before I was on the board, uh, but I, I do see it as a great resource for Tarpon Springs. And thank you for all your hard work. And thank you for verifying that the tax dollars were spent uh, appropriately. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? <coughs> Here not. Thank you so much. Hey, Bob, thank you for your work. <coughs> item number four is the city building inspections and maintenance. Mr. Robinson. For the green light from the boss we're good no okay <laughs> um i'm bob robertson project administration department director and thank you for your kind words um i'm here tonight to present a brief discussion on maintenance of city facilities i will highlight some of the functions of the public works facility maintenance division highlight some past present and future facilities maintenance projects and discuss the proposed upcoming annual facilities condition assessment program the Facilities Maintenance Division of the Public Works Department is responsible for the maintenance of over 68 city-owned facilities, totaling over 220,000 square feet of space and valued at about $41 million. Under the direction of Tom Function, Public Works Director, who's here tonight, and Joe Wraith, Facilities Management Superintendent, the division consists of six full-time employees. One of those positions provides full-time janitorial services, and another one provides full-time traffic and facilities signage installation re replacement and repair. So that means they have four full-time staff to provide other duties to, of the division, which include tasks like painting, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, moving furniture, seasonal decorating, special events, um, small capital projects, and renovations, and general facility upkeep. So they do a lot of, a lot of work. Um, looking back in the work order system, way back in 2012, they averaged about 860 work requests a year. It's about 72 a month. Um, and in the more recent years, they've averaged about 1,200 a year or about 100 a month. That's about a 37% increase in daily workload without really increasing staff. Over the last few years, the Facilities Maintenance Division has been able to complete more than 50 in-house projects, capital improvement projects. A few examples would be renovation of the community center kitchen, uh, the Safford House, some deck board replacements that were done, Craig Park restroom remodeling, um, remodeling of the IT office upstairs here in City Hall, renovation of the old PD um, right next door here, and uh, many projects like that. 
Furthermore, the division has identified 17 new in-house projects that are in progress or planned for the coming year or so. A few examples of those are the um, City Hall, the box office you see coming in right outside in the, in the lobby here, uh, li library restroom renovations, clerk's office renovations coming up, and uh, City Hall restroom upgrades that may be coming soon. These are in addition to contracted improvements that are coming, like the cultural center renovations, library roof replacement, and the community center shower and restroom renovations, which uh, is just going out the bid. Uh, so they do a lot for a small division, and they are definitely a busy group. So looking forward, the department wants to create a sort of master plan for facilities maintenance, and that's where, where I come in. Uh, my department will be teaming up with the Public Works Department and with the Building Department to create an annual facilities condition assessment report. As your backup memo explains, this will be a report for each city facility, starting with an inspection. Um, and the, the inspection team will consist of someone from Public Works, uh, a building inspector, and um, Nick Macris, my project super, supervisor, who will be leading the effort and coordinating the team. The inspection team will look at many aspects of city facilities, such as flooring, electrical, plumbing, roofing, security, general facility condition, just to name a few. The team will also interview staff and perhaps customers that regularly use the facilities to pinpoint areas of concern and capture them in the report. The conceptual cost estimates will be prepared for the identified needs, and these costs can then be used to either create new work orders for immediate or easily addressed needs, uh, to program work into the next budget year, or to plan out work for multiple years. I expect to have this report updated on an annual basis. I have spoken with Tom and with Kevin, Building De Development Director, and I have their commitments to assisting uh, Nick in creating this report every year. And that's the plan going forward. Um, so I'll be happy to any answer any questions that you may have. Bob, thank you. This is, I love to see this actual plan. And if you create a spreadsheet and give us the uh, estimated cost and the description of the work as well. And uh, I'd like to uh, have the Budget Advisory Committee to, uh, to see that. Um, that way we can calculate that into the budget as well. Sure. And after it's completed, if we put that on the website so all the citizens have access to it. Absolutely. Thank you. Any commission come? Sure. Thanks, Ms. Bob. Sieber. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bob, always for your hard work and, and also your um, proactive uh, plans, as always. Uh, I think this annual assessment is important. Uh, I'd like for us to have, be, have that with us to be shared. Um, the operations renovations that you've done, I've seen some of them, and they're quite impressive. Um, the yeah, bathrooms at the work. marina, I'd like one like that. <laughs> and and the projects that you have planned, uh, I'm sure are going to be great. So you're saving the city money and, and doing a great job. So I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Good, Mr. Clark. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the, the update. I, I know I asked about this, I think, a few weeks ago. And thanks for bringing this forward. Uh, I do think it's a very important process to make sure that's documented for all of the commission and the board and also the residents to know. Uh, and then it's also important from a planning perspective as well. So not to have a surprise show up in the middle of the budget year and have to axe a certain project to cover a large expense for a repair if it's a roof or if it's a siding or if the bathroom or whatever it may be um, in the event of emergency. So um, I do think this is a great idea to have an annual report and to uh, see just so we're all have an idea of what's coming ahead in the future as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob, thank you for, for this um, and your proactive approach. I know it's been, we've had some concerns within the community. Some mm -hmm. people have voiced their concerns about um, having our buildings assessed and, and getting an update every year. So I think this is, a, uh, this is really great to have. Um, and it will help it with budget as well so we can get these projects budgeted properly. So um, again, I'm, I'm excited about this. And I know later in the, in the um, meeting, we have some reorg coming up. And I think that would, um, for some of the departments, so I think that would help with this as well, give more people. Because you're saying now we have, what, basically four staff doing all this in-house work. Yeah. So uh, we're stretched. And, and um, I know they're working hard at it. So um, 
I, I just think this is great. Again, you know, thank you for all your hard work, and, and then everybody will be coming together. Tom will be coming together with you, and um, and uh, I think it's just going to be great for the city all around. Especially, you know, we have our historic buildings here, and mm -hmm. um, just an old building, so they really need to be looked at. And uh, there's there's some of them that are, that are in disrepair. That so hopefully we can um, catch the problem before it gets worse and then we can't repair it <laughs> so again thank you for all your hard work on this thank you are there any public comments on this item you know i'll take it thank you we are now going to the uh, consent agenda number five is the uh, minutes october 2nd 2018 the regular session number six is the attorney fees a is a trash dino Invoice 56900. B is Johnson and Jackson. Invoice 2979, 2980, and 3163. Number seven is the award file 190010. NRS single source purchase of order control chemicals. Number eight is the award file number 180176. BRS supply and deliver access security equipment. Number nine is to extend, extend file number 170163 CRS, technology solutions with related equipment and accessories through source well contract number 100614 CDW. And number 10 is to ratify an increase to bid number 180139 BCM to surface public, public works yard. Any items that you'd like to pull? I just want to make a quick comment. Okay. Um, I did have an, a question on number eight, and I did have it explained. I thought the cameras were a bit expensive uh, per camera, um, but I do understand the importance of having a quality camera in our buildings to making sure that recordings are done accurately and in, in the event that we could tell who people are. And I'm excited to hear that we're doing some in-house projects to install the items as well. So, thank, thank you, and I agree with you. This is an item we'll be waiting for a long time. No chief is ready for it. Also on that project, there's 13 video intercom systems going in and 30 door controllers. So it's a big project. Yeah. Thank you. Any commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Five through ten. You're done. I will detain the motion. Motion, motion to approve. Second. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Merrill Hussis? Yes. Item number 11 is to authorize the execution of revised agreement for uh, city attorney, city manager. Would you present this item? Um, just briefly, this is this is the contract from the city attorney's office. Um, we've talked about a little bit coming. Basically, all the same. Um, any questions you have, the representative of the city attorney's office is here to answer any of those questions. I don't have a question because it's pretty clear, but I, I just want to comment that uh, the wages and uh, the agreement is compatible to the other cities in Pinellas County. So uh, I'm supporting that, the agreement. Any commission comments? I have no comments. Or? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I had the same, about around the same um, lines that you just mentioned, Mayor, is that looking at the other cities, we had a, a survey done uh, amongst all the cities to see how comparable our rates are of the city of Tarpon Springs to the other rates of the cities in Pinellas County. And they do fall in line from the retainer fee to the hourly fee, um, et cetera. So uh, I'm willing to support this as well. No comments. No comment. I made my comments at the last meeting. <laughs> okay. Come and see well, I want to reiterate what I said at the last meeting is um, these, these fees are in line with the other cities. And I also had pulled um, as a rec request of all attorney fees that we pay, not only our um, current attorney here, but we have other attorney fees that we pay, you know, specialized in other, and we are in line with what other cities are paid throughout the year for fees. So um, I would approve this recommendation. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Yeah, not. Did you want to comment? I'm just here to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the chair will detain the motion. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kipta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Merrill Hussis? Yes. 
Item number 12 is to approve a settlement agreement for 1717 Mandalay Drive, Court Enforcement Lien, case number 16800002920. See attorney if you present this item. Uh, yes, Board of Commissioners, this is for a code enforcement lien settlement at uh, 1717 Mandalay Drive in Tarpon Springs. Um, this case concerns a property owner which constructed a foundational elements on their property, which was eventually intended to be a residential structure, but it failed to proceed past the phase of constructing the concrete columns. Uh, the concrete columns have been left in the ground and they are extending upright from the ground. Um, the city engaged in enforcement efforts to uh, get compliance with the code um, and compliance was sought and not had so the code enforcement board upon presentation found that the property owner was in violation and ultimately imposed fines on october 13th 2017 the code enforcement officer issued a memorandum to the code enforcement board where he sought the board's authorization to foreclose on the lien um, and the code enforcement board voted to authorize the foreclosure of the code lien to proceed. It resulted in the filing of a foreclosure action by our office. Uh, while the violation does continue to exist on the property, the owner has agreed to remove it per the terms of the attached settlement agreement, which once approved by the city will be filed with the court and binding on the parties. The reason that the settlement is before the board at this time is because there was a procedural issue that had to deal with a certificate of service with notice um, to the property owner. Uh, Mr. Trask spent a heck of a time trying to find the property owner and serve them with process. Ultimately, there was um, a clerical error, and due to the clerical error, there was a potential due process issue. Uh, due to that potential due process issue, the city attorney engaged in negotiations and with the consultation of city staff, um, was able to arrive at a, a stipulation of settlement, which is attached in your backup. Um, with the property owner's attorney. Uh, the settlement agreement accomplishes the goals of demolition of the columns that are erected on the property um, and through accumulated fines and costs will, with the exception of the payment of $1,000, not be available. So we're not able to recover our fines and costs, but they will make a $1,000 payment to the city. However, should the owner fail to comply with the settlement agreement um, and breach that settlement agreement, she's agreed that the city may proceed with the foreclosure action, which would include um, fees and costs. So the remedy is to um, get compliance and also receive a payment of $1,000. Uh, if there is no compliance, then it would revert. There will be no further um, objections as far as the foreclosure action is concerned with regards to any due process violations. And with that, I can answer any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Commerce, Commissioner Kitt. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Trask for reaching out um, which reached out to me the other day just to explain what was happening. But I am familiar with this case because it's been going on for quite a while, and I've been, you know, been sitting up here for some time. So, um, and I know they've been very difficult to deal with or hard to reach. So I would love to see those columns come down. I would love it. So, you know, if they don't comply in 30 days, um, we take action. So, and I, I'd like to, I, I can't wait, I can't wait for the 30 days to see if they comply, honestly, because like I said, they've been very difficult through this whole situation. So, um, and, and it's an eyesore in the community for the neighbors and stuff. So again, I wanted to thank um, Attorney Trask for reaching out and, and going into detail about this situation and um, hopefully we can rectify it in 30 days. Thank you. Commissioner Corr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I did speak in detail with um, our city attorney about this. Erica, can you um, let me know where the clerical error happened in this situation? Of course. So there was a certificate of service that was for a notice that was a legally compliant notice that needed to go to the property owner. Um, I believe what happened, which is um, within your backup, is that there, the city clerk um, used a, a template of some sort, and there was the incorrect address on it. Um, it wasn't caught at the city level. It was sent to our office. It was also not caught on our level. Um, and the certificate of service was sent, the notice was sent to an incorrect property owner. Um, and so because of that clerical error, mm -hmm. even though the real property owner had noticed because of that clerical error, that poses a potential due process issue. Okay. So we had to go through the whole process again. We would. Right. Okay. Well, unless not, if we were not going to enter, enter into the settlement agreement, yes, that would be correct. But if the settlement agreement is approved and entered into, um, the property owner has the 30 days to comply, which is ultimately the goal of code enforcement. And then if there is no compliance, 
then we just move forward and there will be no objection with regard to the due process issue. And to reiterate and confirm, this has already been signed by the um, property owner, right? Correct. It just needs to be approved by the board. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Sieber. Yes, I agree with uh, Commissioner uh, Kitka. I feel that we need to move on with this. It has been going on for a long time and she came before us last year and, and um, she hasn't been in compliance and denying this would mean more time, more money, uh, and maybe she never takes down the, the columns and, and they, they're an eyesore and, and bothering the neighbors for so many years. So I do feel like we need to uh, go ahead with the settlement. Thank you. I also agree with the uh, recommendation of the city attorney, and I'm glad we're finally going to resolve this issue. We're going to remove those columns and bring this property into compliance. So that would be nice to the neighborhood. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Hear none. I will obtain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Merrill Hoosis? Yes, thank you. We are now going to the item number 13, which is the award bid number 180148 BJJ Construction for 10, Wells 10, <coughs> 11, and 14 in Roe Wall, Maine. Mr. LeCurse? Yes. Paul Smith. Robin, Paul Smith? Okay. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. This project involves completing the installation of equipment, pipeline, and communications to add three production wells to our RO facility. This project spent several years in the making involving extensive coordination with Duke Energy and other agencies and also a detailed design and procurement processes. We're recommending the low bid out of five responses and the pricing compares favorably to our engineer's estimate. Well, thank you. And um, those three wells actually put us closer to the goal, which is 22 wells, right? We're getting close closer to Closer to the goal, yes. Yeah. Uh, I've got a technical question that I'd like to ask you. Those three wells will be connected together, and we're going to be using one home run into the auto plan, or it's going to be a separate home run? Well, the piping will be networked into the raw water lines, but the communications will have a dedicated line coming into the RO plant. And the dedicated, the, the fiber optic cable you're talking Correct. about? Correct. That's going to be for each individual to be able to communicate with uh, Scudder, or it's going to be stuff? Well, it is a communication form for us. Uh, we do have it connected to other parts of the system just to uh, keep the cost down. So it's basically the shortest path to get connected to our system. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad we have uh, a state-of-the-art system, and uh, we our people can monitor that from anywhere. So I'm glad that we're running the fiber optic cable to bring it together. Thank you. Any commission comments? Commissioner Carr. I've got a few questions. Um, just so the public's aware, this is this costs about one point three million dollars for these three wells and it's a pretty important process to the water supply of the city of Tarpon Springs. And Paul, I just want to ask you a few questions um, that you could help us just educate the residents and um, some people watching. So how does this proposal compare to the past wells that were drilled? Is it in line or is it a lot more? What are we seeing? Uh, cost? The simplest answer is yes, it's in line. It's a little bit of apples and oranges comparing before because we had a design build process going there. So we're paying for a little bit of design in those prices. This is just construction prices, but we did take a look at it and they look about the same. Okay. Um, the permit is for 22 wells, like the mayor mentioned. Um, uh, is it planned to drill all 22, or are we good with this amount? Well, we would like more. Um, originally, we permitted up to 22 just because we knew that was the time to do that, and that is a goal to work towards. But it is uh, a challenge getting property acquisition. I mean, that's really our limiting factor. And uh, as soon as we see opportunities, we uh, go for them and put wells in where we can in a phased manner. So that's what we're going to continue to do. This is an important step in that direction. And within a certain area, like you have a target area that you look for, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Does the permit expire for the 22 wells? Yes, it's a 20-year permit through the Water Management District, which actually is quite good. Um, many of the permits are only, uh, I think, 10 years, Bob, or six in some cases. So this uh, shows confidence on their part in our plan and how we manage our well field. Okay. Um, what is a useful life of a well? 
So we're drilling these wells. How long do we expect them to last? Wells can last 50 years or more. Um, some of it has to do with the formation that the well is completed into. Some of that's beyond our control. That's Mother Nature sort of stuff. But, you know, sometimes wells will collapse uh, down deep, and uh, sometimes they can be rehabilitated, but other times we need to drill a replacement well. So 50 years is a reasonable average for most of them. Okay. What about the pumps themselves? The pumps, we've uh, selected them for the environment they're in, which is a very salty type of water. So um, that's partly the cost that you're seeing there. And we expect to get somewhere around 10 to 15 years from the pumps with, um, with those proper selections. Okay. Uh, what type of maintenance does the city do to make sure these pumps are extended as long as we can extend them without them being compromised and breaking? Well, the best thing we can do is monitor their performance, which is what we do. We have sophisticated instrumentation that we can keep track of how these wells are performing, how much flow are we getting out of them, how much pressure are they producing. And when we see something that drifts away from the manufacturer's specification, that gives us a signal that we need to pull the pump out, inspect it, do maintenance, or possibly uh, repair parts to bring it back to its uh, capacity. Okay. Uh, is there any impact expected to the residents in these areas where the new wells are going, a.k.a. sinkholes, any other concerns? Yeah, that's a, a common question, and, and it's something we looked at very heavily before we even started the project. And the simplest answer is when you manage the well field and keep those withdrawals limited like we're doing, the effects of uh, well pumping are not correlated with sinkholes. In fact, it's been studied extensively in other communities and uh, by hydrogeologists and found that, you know, where the sinkholes were weren't where the wells were and vice versa. So, um, you know, there has been over pumping and, and, air and agricultural type things that we have seen those kind of effects, but that's really not the case with what we're doing. Okay. And then this is, uh, the funds are coming from the water treatment plant fund, and that's coming from... The, our water bills ultimately? Yes, it's okay. part of our capital improvement plan. Okay. Yeah. And that's over the 10 year period that we approved that's correct. earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? No comment. Roll call. Oh, excuse me. I need a motion. Motion, motion, motion. to approve. Second. And now roll call. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Kikta? Yes. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Merrill Hoosis. Yes, thank you. Next is item number 14, which is the ordinance 2018 26 change the uh, of scheduling of Board of Commissioners meeting. And this is a second reading. City Attorney, if you please read the ordinance. Ordinance number 2018-26, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending Chapter 2, Administration, Article 7, Rules of Procedure of the Board of Commissioners, Division 3 Meetings, Section 2-131, Time of Meetings, Subsection A, Time of Meetings. Duration, to change the days of the regular meetings of the Board of Commissioners to be held each month and providing for an effective date. This was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on October 5, 2018. Thank you. Mr. LaCour, do you have any additional information this second reading? No additional no. information. Are there any commission comments? I don't have a problem. Are there any public comments on this side? I hear none. Mr. LaCour, I'd like to emphasize that we notify the people by putting a notification on the uh, yeah. water bills water or bill and also on the website. Yeah. Thank you. I need a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And we're all called, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Merrill Hoosis? Yes. Thank you. Item number 15 is uh, the ordinance 2018 25, the application 18112, special area plan modification, SDC. This is the first reading. The city attorney will read the ordinance. Ordinance number 2018-25, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending certain sections of Appendix B, Community Redevelopment Area and Sponge Dock Smart Code, of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, by amending Table 4E, Subsection I, Building Function, by allowing 49 seats for food service establishments in transects where the retail use is limited, 
amending Table 5A Code Summary to change the building function from limited to open in the SDC transect, and amending Table 5B Subsection 6 SDC Marine Industrial Slash Commercial to change the building function from limited to open and providing for severability and for an effective date. Staff report. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Heather Earler, staff for this application and your Planning and Zoning Director. Um, this uh, amendment is being brought forward actually um, by the staff. And essentially on the second page of your staff report, there is a map locating the actual um, locations within the transect. So this is part of your um, sponge docks and your CRA special area plan. And this is a specific um, transect, which the SD category stands for special district. And the C category specifically under that special district stands for the marine and commercial district. So they're broken up into four categories underneath the special district. It's to basically the special district recognizes the unique characteristics of a particular um, area within um, the sponge docks or within the CRA area within the CRA itself. This particular um, amendment is looking at changing um, three different portions of the actual um, transect code. The first one would be table 4E, which is exhibit A1. And in that, under the retail category, under limited restrictive, the staff is looking to change um, the number of uh, seats allowed for neighborhood retail food service from 40 to 49. This request is being changed or being requested basically to calibrate the um, transect code to the Florida Building Code. The Florida Building Code under the B occupancy allows up to 49 seats. Staff feels that given um, that category, it is easier for us to administer along with the um, Florida Building Code, that provision, so that we're not further restricting down um, people who want to do small restaurants um, down to the 40 seats beyond what's allowed under the Florida Building Code. So that's the first request that's being requested. That the, that's the first part of this request. The second one is under Exhibit um, 2A, and essentially it kind of relates to the table that you're seeing here. So under the Table 4, this talks about the different functions of a building. So buildings can either be restricted, they can be limited, or they can be open. And essentially in this special district area, we're looking to change the limitation under the retail function from limited use to open use. In order for us to make that change, essentially what it means is we have to change the summary code table, which is table 5A, which is um, exhibit T, which is exhibit A2, and we have to change um, on exhibit A3, the actual table that guides the development within the individual transects itself. So that's where the zoning, is, the zoning setbacks are laid out. That's where the parking limitations are laid out. That's the very specifics of the meat and potatoes of how a piece of property is actually developed. This change essentially would allow for the limitations that you see under that um, limited retail section that we're actually going to change to no longer apply to this particular transect. It would, it would, what would then apply is the open retail use. So building area available for retail development use would be limited um, by the requirement of the parking and so the requirement for parking and for the setbacks rather than limiting it further limiting it by the number of seats or a specific arbitrary chosen square footage which is what you see happening in the limited retail category so that's essentially the the crux of what the change is here i can answer any question that you may the questions that you may have but this was actually workshopped our um with uh, the trc uh, beginning of last week and they had no concerns with it they they passed it along without any changes and it went to planning board last night at planning board there were some comments um, those comments included um, questions about specifically what the changes were and then also questions about why we were changing that and, and the why is because the area we're seeing interest from for the first time in, in, in some time for this area to train it seems to be transitioning it seems to be transitioning and we see having requests coming in for new restaurants in the area so seeing that transition in order to encourage any type of redevelopment we need to open up and have a little bit more flexibility with the uses that are the the functions of the buildings that are allowed with that 
that doesn't mean you're not going to see those projects. Those projects are still going to come through the formal site planning process. They would still become before this board, each an individual project that is actually going to actually uh, eventually make it through the process would have to prove to you that they're meeting all of the requirements of the transect code. So what all this changes is functionally changing so that people can actually make that request to you through the site planning process. Right now they can't. They're limited to 40 seats for food service of any kind. That includes the existing restaurant that is in this transect. So with that, I can answer any other questions you have. Thank you. Commissioner Kickley, you got a question? Sure. Well, thank you. I just want to make some comments. Again, this is um, um, another example of thinking to the future and thinking kind of outside the box. Um, our ultimate goal is, and Heather is doing such a great job, but i got to say, Heather, I mean, this is, thank you for this. Um, you know, we want to bring more people into our community. This is our ultimate goal. And I would love to see that area developed where we can have more restaurants or something more along the waterfront. But I, what I'd like to also see is if we could pull up by boat when we're on the river all day or out on the island all day and we're coming up and we want to stop for a bite to eat or um, a cocktail, whatever. We want to be able to pull up by boat and get off. And I think the only place right now that I've been to is Shrimp Wreck. Um, I, I asked our, our marina our city marina and they said we can come in there if we wanted to but um i don't know if this will allow any anywhere that we could um space along the seawall to tie up or anything do you this particular change no but that is something that these future projects that would be allowed if, if this passes any future restaurants there that are, are able to open up that waterfront, they would have the ability to put that as part of their site plan. And that's one of the things that one of the particular people actually sent us to Tampa to, to kind of talk to Tampa because Tampa's kind of experienced that issue with the boat tie-up parking and how they, they coordinate that with their project. So it's something that me and my staff are looking into to kind of it's another alternative to provide for another option that we don't currently have here. But there are other communities not too far away that do have that. Can you count that as parking spaces? Um, not, most places don't currently count them as parking okay. spaces. There, it would just be adjacent, it would be an additional option that you provide essentially dockage for your facility. It's not usually counted as a, an alternative to a parking space. Because again, the parking spaces are based on the seating capacity so, and right now your code doesn't recognize boat parking as an option. Where we do for bike and ped, we're not quite at that point where boats qualify as a mode of transportation. However, they are a mode of transportation. Yeah, maybe something we could maybe look into one day. But I think this is a great idea. Like I said, I'd love to see that area revitalized. And like I said, you know, our main goal is to bring people to our community. And this is another way of, of doing that. So I want to thank you for your work on this. Commissioner Steve. Yes, I have to agree uh, with Susan. Uh, this is a beautiful riverfront area, and uh, I would love to see it develop more uh, to enhance the sponge docks, bring more people to, to that end of, of the street or the town and, and the sponge docks. Um, I like also with this open, um, I'm looking at the industrial, um, where the operations shall be screened from public right of way. So, is that correct? Well, the <laughs> open is only going to, in this case, refer to the retail use. I'm not looking at the industrial use because industrial is already kind of worked into that working waterfront concept, which really the special district is trying to protect. There's not the li there's not as much limiting factors, I think, that as some people would like to have there, and there's potential to add those in, but we're not looking at the industrial component because that's kind of already worked into what's existing there for the industrial piece. But I, 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 real, I agree, this, is, uh, this could be a beautiful area to develop and, and enhance. And, um, and about uh, docking, uh, we get that complaint all the time on the docks. There's nowhere to, to dock. So I think if we could look at that in the future somehow, and maybe with these developments too, to put in some, uh, some docking for people who want to come by boat. So something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I want to reiterate, I think the city we had to ask our question, how does the city of Tarpon Springs encourage growth and attract growth in the city? Um, this does sound like one of the avenues to do that. I do have a couple questions and obviously some further clarification if we could. Mm -hmm. um, 
parking is rather limited. So there's just two areas that we're looking at. One area is uh, the property just before you go over the river on Pinellas Avenue, and then the majority of the property is on the west end of the sponge docks along it, which is mostly working waterfront, right? And that's an area that it's, a, it's an important part of those sponge docks. We want to protect the working waterfront, but we also want to encourage growth as well. Um, since the parking is limited in these areas, what is the requirement for a, a, a restaurant or a business that may come in in one of these areas? So right now under that particular, um, it tells you right there that there's three assigned parking spaces required for each thousand square foot, and that would include the thousand square foot of seating area. So you'd break down the actual seating area, whether it's inside or outside, because it's not spe specified here. It doesn't matter whether it's inside or outside. It's the total square footage of area devoted to seating and devoted to kitchen and devoted to all of the other pieces that you need to have for a restaurant. So you would look at that total square footage and then three spaces for each per each thousand based on what we have now. Okay, just, and I understand the way this code is written somewhat in the aspect of you, you don't have a lot of parking necessarily by where these mm -hmm. businesses are because there's parking at other parts of the district. Um, if there was an applicant that were to come forward, could we re require additional parking or is that the code to hold us back from that? Um, well, what we would do is we would look at their specific use and what they're actually planning for. So really the size of the restaurant really is going to dictate that. And then also, is there an avenue for other modes other than just straight car parking? Is there another, is there another avenue to get people there to this location? And then we would also look for them to partner with existing parking lots if possible. Um, to do shared parking. So the answer to that is yes and no. You can't really force them to do beyond what you're required in the code, but you certainly, there are creative me methods for us to ensure that the parking based on what they're potentially looking at for how many staff are gonna be on a particular shift and those types of things, we can certainly look at those things and talk about th those things as part of that planning process. It, to me, we wanna be respectful of our current business owners that are in the area and also the the residents that live in the area too because the last thing you want is agreed a mess uh on the roadways um okay and then can you give me another example of, of what the limited versus open on the retail um building function i, I need to grasp that a little bit better I, okay. I don't think i understand it so right now under the districts that have limited um areas for retail if you think about me like alt 19 as the main corridor through the district mm -hmm. when you go out from that corridor because that's on in a five quick category that's in a five category and then the main downtown along tarpon avenue is a five category outside of that when you start looking at the actual plan i don't have the whole district here to look at but if you look at the district wide you'll see that there's a fours all around that area their t's just designate the different allowed uses essentially is what it do it doing some uses are allowed some uses aren't everything that's kind of outside that tarpon the main downtown tarpon of downtown and alt 19 is restricted into that retail use so they can only do small retail there and they can only do these limited restaurants there um, there is no other allowance for a large restaurant so i'm talking areas like um, on orange areas on Tarpon Ave going down towards uh, the bayou, those are in those restricted categories where the, the retail use is restricted down to small retail use. So you're not going to get a large store down there based on the way the zoning categories are set right now. So that's, I mean, that's the difference. It's, it's really, it's thought of that that main corridor is going to be where the main intense uses are gonna be, and then along Tarpon Avenue, and then everything around it's gonna be smaller and supporting the larger, the larger businesses around it. Okay, so it, this is gonna be extreme. Obviously, a Walgreens wouldn't wanna come build on the waterfront here, but it, it basically would say it's a larger retail business could come in here if they wanted to, but it, this is more targeting restaurants in this situation right yeah and again you're going to drive that because you're going to do they're go those uses those larger retail uses also have to have more companies they're going to want a drive through they're going to want those things are restricted in these districts so while yes the use the size of the use might be able to get there depend the other dependent uses that they have are subordinate uses that come along with those uses won't work here because they're not allowed Okay. The, so the accessory pieces don't work, unfortunately, was for some of those larger retail. Okay, got it. Um, 
Secondly, did we notify business owners in the district currently, or how do we go about doing that in the past? So in this particular, in this particular amendment, this is amendment for the district wide. So statutorily, what's required is what we amend. We, we are amending the, di the district on a whole. So when you amend the district on the whole, the only requirement for notice is the advertisement in the newspaper for the ordinance amendment. It is, we're not required to notice the individual property owners within this because we're not changing, we're changing on district-wide basis, not on an individual lot basis. Okay. Um, is there a reason why we didn't look at like lodging or anything else in that stand front? Or is this just the area that people have had questions about in the past? Well, the lodging is kind of, you've already done an amendment a lot with the lodging that pretty much opened up all of, a lot of the districts to kind of encourage, um, additional ho hotels to come into that area. So that's already been set by a previous ordinance, so they're allowed. Okay, because in this, well, this specific district, it looks like it's it, limited It is limited, to yes. Bed and it is, right? Yeah, it's limited to the bed and breakfast to the smaller scale, but lodging was contemplated. But certainly uh, right across the street is one of, uh, on the other side of Roosevelt is one of the areas that we potentially have had people interested in for a hotel, on a hotel site. So again, the limiting factor becomes um, some of the historic uses that you have in that area and, and your um, pattern, for, your actually your grid pattern for the roadways has become an issue on that property. Okay. So. All right. This is just for a reminder to everybody, this is the first reading and there's, if this passes, there's a second reading, right? Okay. Thank you. A reminder, we do have three weeks between the second reading, so there's plenty of time for people. We've got an extra Tuesday in the month of October, so there's three weeks for anybody who needs more information, more things to get with staff before you hear it at another public hearing on the 6th. Heather, I want to thank you for spending time in discussing the um, um, the uh, special district with me, and um, it was very helpful. Uh, has been our goal to attract more businesses down to the area, and I think by uh, modifying the um, the special district down there, we're accomplishing that. Um, the uh, allowing in more commercial, more restaurants is that will be very useful to the area, and I think this <coughs> will be a, a wise thing to do. I like to hear from uh, from the businesses down there too, and see what their uh, opinion is and their recommendations as well. <coughs> Thank you. Well, some of them are in the audience, so. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Hi. Uh, Julianne Russell, 616 Island Drive, Tarpon Springs. Um, of course, I'm sure most of you know I own Rusty Bellies, and so I encourage additional businesses to come into the area. My comment mainly is the fact that one, not being notified by finding out just today that this was happening is kind of um, a little disheartening because, um, you know, I am involved in the community. Uh, I want to make sure that um, we don't lose the fishing portion of in the stone crab traps and the a, being the ability to unload boats. Um, that is something that has been our heritage and Tarpon Springs heritage for many, many years. Um, I think another area that commission needs to look at is the fact that uh, there is a lot of limit to the amount of parking that is down there. And, you know, we have gone, our, our family has gone out and purchased quite a bit of parking in the uh, past 32 years that we've been there to just um, be able to accommodate our own restaurant. And I think that uh, these changes will bring more people. But what I find is the docks themselves with the... Uh, charging for the, you know, parking on the docks themselves and us trying to, as a family, trying not to do that, we seem to get a lot of the overflow of parking because it's free. And I think that no matter what, I think the commission needs to look at the fact that it's going to need some parking to be able to accommodate 
several other restaurants in the area, uh, I think it can work, but I think that that's going to be a problem. And we're already limited on our space as far as our parking is concerned. So I think that that is an area that needs to be worked on. I'm all for making the changes to make things better. So I, you know, look at it as positive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comment? Uh, Ed Spaeth, uh, 5515 uh, Island Drive. Um, I own a piece of property on in this special district area that is you know, being talked about of uh, what the potential use could or could not be. I've owned uh, that one piece for about seven years now, trying to find some use for it. Um, recently this year, I've bought four other lots um, on that block off of Island Drive. Um, I also own Turtle Cove Marina. Uh, I started that project in 2002 in this town and I'm still here. Um, I am all for bringing more people to the town. Um, I know 90% of my boaters currently park at my facility and go to other restaurants in that area that are located right there. Um, I do agree um, that there is a parking issue down there, but I do feel from what staff has talked about being able to work together with adjacent business owners that have the potential of lots that are already there can be you know, blended together with existing businesses that want to come into the area. Um, I'm all for helping another business owner be successful. Um, and uh, I'm just for the amendment. And um, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Hear none. Heather, can I ask you another question, please? Can you explain to us was a concern that the possibility is that we might lose um, the working front or the stone craft area? That's not going to affect that, is it? Well, I mean, potentially, depending upon any further restrictions that you put on there, I would like to see the business owners down there come together and kind of talk about what they want what they want that area to look like. What is it that they're trying to maintain? Because I agree, I think that part of the draw of that waterfront isn't just the waterfront, it's the history that's there. Sure. Um, and what does that history look like? Does that look like some type of interpretive signing or, or trail that kind of talks about the, the history? Or does that, that or is that some other um, type of placemaking component? And I think that that's something that needs to be worked into whatever eventually develops down there. And that's something that at least my staff would be super interested in working with these folks and if, if necessary, putting together either a separate protection plan for it or integrating into your existing transect for that specific special district provisions that actually you know codify those uses over time. So if crab traps and, and, and that being stacked up, I mean I can't I come from New England. I am very familiar with the fishing village concept. I used to live, go to the wharf every year in Nantucket and and, and spend time there. I mean it, it, that's very common from the environment that I came from. So those can be codified in there and if those are the types of things that folks want to see down there we certainly can find that and, and find ways to integrate that into the environment and, and and make that you know the basis for that place um, making it a, a little bit of a more unique environment in that particular little portion of island drive thank you i think it's very important that we keep the character of the area because that's going to help the businesses as well i agree that's a great idea heather and and of course we want to keep what's what's down there and, and, and the industry and the history. So I think it's a good idea to, to see what we want in that area uh, for the business owners and, and maybe have a plan at some point. Agreed. Thank you. I need a motion? Motion to approve. Second. And roll call. <clears throat> Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikna? Yes. Commissioner Seaver? Yes. Mayor Luzes? Yes. Thank you. We are now going to the item number 16, which is the resolution 2018-10, utility reorganization. 
City Attorney, if you please read the resolution. Resolution number 2018-10, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing changes in the organization of utilities functions within the Public Services Department, specifically including adding apprentice, technician, and mechanic positions, upgrading certain technician and coordinator positions to a higher wage grade, revising position descriptions, and providing for an effective date hereof. Staff report. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. Since the RO plant came online in late 2015, uh, we've gained some valuable experience on our new water system. That water system includes not only the RO facility, but all of the pipes that take that water to our customers. And um, additional resources are required, primarily at the frontline worker level to accomplish our services and maintain our infrastructure. And this item proposes to accomplish this. I also want to add it is included in our current rate plan. This was part of our uh, contemplated expenses moving forward, and uh, this is what I'm presenting to you tonight. So some of the benefits of this additional personnel I speak of, um, this is primarily in our water distribution, sewage collection, and utilities maintenance divisions. And this is to provide our required backflow inspections and reclaim water connection inspections new installations to be scheduled and completed more quickly, system flushing and valve operation, hydrant maintenance on the water system, and then over on the sewer area, doing uh, the required video inspection and cleaning of the sewer lines. We also have the ability to self-perform instead of contract our maintenance and smaller scale construction projects. We'll have increased utilities maintenance mechanic capabilities for more in-house maintenance and repair additional staff to allow for response to daily calls and inquiries. There's a tremendous amount of daily unpredictable workload that these divisions face. So this is something that just will help us provide our services more efficiently. Um, and then provide more career pathways. One of the things I'm very proud of is our apprentice program that you all uh, supported. And this is something that we're finding great success with promoting from within, introducing a, a career for someone to start out and then stay with the organization. In fact, we've had our best success with that approach versus hiring higher level experienced people from the outside. And this will provide additional resources in the event of emergencies, which would include hurricane events, which unfortunately are becoming all too common these days. Summary of the reorganization, what is being proposed is three position upgrades and five additional positions. I want to emphasize again, these are frontline level type positions. These are the workers, the boots on the ground, the people that get that work done out in the field every day it really will reflect on our productivity. I'd like to show it graphically here. I've got some color-coded boxes here. The uh, green shows the proposed upgraded positions, the three positions I mentioned. And these include um, upgrading a technician three to what's called a lead technician position on both the water side and the sewer collection side. What this will allow us to do is there's a lot of paperwork associated with these daily activities, record keeping, logging, work order processing, and that sort of thing. If we can take that up at the worker supervisory level, it allows the supervisor to do more of the planning and day-to-day -day type things that he needs to do. While also these lead technicians can be on the job site inspecting the work, training those lower level workers, and performing some of the work themselves. The other upgrade is promoting going from a Technician 1 to a Technician 2 on one of the crews designated for installations on the water distribution side. And this will allow um, the lead worker type of approach to, again, train, supervise, and assist with the work. The five new positions include a dedicated position for utility locates. That's very important. We get a tremendous volume of these requests. And this is any time there's construction, relocation, any kind of work going on where there's utilities nearby, we're required to uh, locate our utilities within a set amount of time, and it's a pretty short time frame. If we don't respond in time, our utilities are at risk of being damaged, and we really have no recourse. So this is something we really need to staff. It's sort of a rotated part-time type function right now. We really need to dedicate a position to doing that. The other one is over on the sewer area. It's a maintenance repair technician to lead that crew. 
And then the final two positions on this org chart are apprentice level positions on the water distribution side and the uh, sewage collection side. And then the final position uh, I'm proposing is in the utility maintenance area. It's basically another skilled maintenance mechanic to add to that crew's capabilities. I mentioned before, how are we planning to pay for this? Um, this has been already anticipated in our current rate study that's been approved. Um, and we've also minimized what we're asking for in terms, of the, in terms of the costs. And how we've done that is at the top management level, we combined positions when one of those positions retired, we combined them into one position. So that's an ongoing savings that we have. And then we're maintaining vacant and frozen positions in areas where the staffing is adequate. For example, at our wastewater plant, we have enough coverage right now, even though there is a vacant A position, we're keeping that vacant unless we need it to provide savings while we have the coverage we need. We're also advancing uh, existing positions and staff instead of creating new positions. So in that case where uh, a position may be promoted with a five to 10% salary increase, that's a lot less expensive than a brand new position with benefits. And finally, as I mentioned before, the use of the apprentice positions allows us to train from within. Those typically start at a lower pay level and that pay level is less than if you um, hired a top of the range person from the outside. So all that put together, our total annual cost is approximately $115,000, including benefits for all of these proposed upgrades and new positions, which is really a very fair price considering all of the work that we're planning to get out of that. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Commissioner Carr, you got a question? Uh, just thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for this presentation. I know it's something we've talked about for quite some time now. Uh, it's important that you keep a close ear to the staff and that we don't have burnout situations where we have a high turnover. Um, I do feel like this is important. I also really value the fact that you're able to evaluate your staff and see that there's not necessarily a need in the one area of the department and that you're not backfilling at just a backfill position. And I think that's valuable in all departments to make sure that we're not just hiring just to hire to fill a spot. Um, but then you also see the need in other parts of your department as well. So um, I'm encouraged to do this. I think this is a very important part of the uh, city of Tarpon Springs to have the staff to um, be able to respond to water breaks and water main breaks and sewer breaks, et cetera, and also service uh, the residents of Tarpon Springs. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm sure this wasn't done in a day, so I really appreciate all the hard work it took to, to get to this uh, end result because I can see all the changes and, and how much you worked on it. Um, I really like the idea of the apprentice technicians. Uh, I know that they've worked, and uh, you can get people in that may never even thought to, to be in this type of field that, that like it and stay and, and move on. So I, I, I really like that, and, and, and it's been working. Um, also, combining positions. Um, it is a great idea, and doing all this with $115,000 annually is, is amazing to me. So, uh, great job, and um, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Clark? Excuse me, kick the. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I just, you know, I, I would just want to echo um, my fellow commissioners. Um, this is a great idea, Paul, and you, you work so hard for us, and I do appreciate what you do, and, and this reorg really makes sense, and again, for only, what is it, $115,000 for the year increase, um, I think this is great for the city, and this, uh, the apprentice program, I just love that idea, I love it, because, you know, we do, you know, it take we lose a lot of people, and it takes so much time to hire and train, and, um, it takes time and money. So we can always, I always believe um, from promoting from within, I think that is a great, you know, they're familiar with the city, how everything works. And I um, mean, it shows that we appreciate them and that they've worked hard for us and, you know, we're willing to promote. So um, I, I, I will support this idea. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith, first of all, I want to congratulate you and everybody else involved for completing 100 projects the last three years. Excellent job, you, congratulations. And I appreciate that you bring in to us the uh, reorganization, promoting three technicians to the leadership role. I think it's 
I think it's great. So given the opportunity to speak and to be able to become uh, supervisor and then manager. Uh, actually, the three positions that uh, out of the five that you're asking, it's actually to backfill the three positions that you're going to promote from. So that leaves you two positions that you're getting ready for growth and to do uh, maintenance on the, our own network. I think it's a good thing to do that and prepare it for the future. And I'm in favor. Thank you, Mayor. That's exactly right. Are there any public comments on this item? You're not? I need a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Seaver? Yes. Mayor Alhusis? Yes, thank you. Well, that concludes the regular station agenda. And we go to the uh, staff comments, police chief. No comments, Mayor, thank you. You want to share with us about Orlando, what happened? Oh, just the annual IACP conference. Yeah, we had, um, Last week, the annual IACP conference in Orlando, which is a, pretty much a global organization, but a lot, of, a lot of people were there, a lot of classes, a lot of training. Uh, vendor shows just absolutely huge. Um, but uh, we had a good conference, a lot of class, took some classes on homeless issues, and we're doing about everything we can do based on you know some of the things going on around the country, especially from a PD perspective with a homeless outreach officer. But... Um, but it's good when that conference comes close by and we, you know, we, I went with both majors and, you know, we took a bunch of different classes, so we got a lot out of it. Thank you. Thank you. City Attorney. No comment. Angel, thank you for coming again. Of course. Thanks it's always me. my pleasure. Any comments? No comments from me. Thank you. Mr. LeCurtis. Yes. Um, tomorrow, sometime tomorrow morning, you'll begin the agenda for our work session on the 22nd. Um, if you consider the brux of it is we're going to talk about the 2018-2019 year. We're going to talk about projects that are budgeted. We're going to talk about some ideas that aren't budgeted. And if you really take it, I'm going to have most of the staff, a lot of staff involved there. So what I consider this work session is a communication effort between the city manager, staff, and the commission. Go over the major projects um, to hear any other uh, concerns or, or anything that you want to say about it. We're going to have to do some prioritization of projects. We're, we've got some great ideas on some projects we're going to need to fit in. Um, so it's not only looking at this budget. There, there's obviously, as I've said for some people with some ideas, we've probably got two and a half years of project out there. So we just want to go over what we've got budgeted, um, other projects, um, we want to give you the update from the last work session on some of the beautification things we've been working on and, and get some more ideas. So it's going to be a big discussion session between all of us to talk about what we're going to see. Um, we plan on getting a lot done this year. Obviously, again, we're facing the vote in November. Um, not the TARP and um, item one, but the, the election for the homestead exemption. If that passes, we all know we're losing immediately a half million dollars from our budget. So next year to do a lot of these projects um, without us being forced by the state to raise our millage rate to do it may be thin. So I'm really excited about this budget and money. We have to get a lot of things done. And uh, again, despite the staff is a lot less than the projects we have, we're gonna try to work to get as much done as efficiently and with what the money we have so this is this is probably going to be one of our biggest years of getting projects done and going and I want to make sure we're on board with the Commission on the priorities um, you know anything that want to be moved into and uh, adjusted as we go along so it's going to be an entire evening of discussion on that and uh, I say the draft agenda will be out tomorrow the final agenda will be out probably Thursday afternoon Friday morning um, so you can get an idea. We've got most, a lot of the preliminary backup in. Again, the backup might change, but we're giving you a rough draft so you get an idea of what's going on, because you may want to notify me you want something added to it, um, some of the projects and some of the ideas. Um, so be looking for that tomorrow. And again, it'll be upstairs, 6.30, Monday the 22nd. Looking forward to that. Deborah, City Clerk. No comment. No comment. Commissioner no. Kicker. No comments. Ms. Weaver. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm looking forward to that, uh, Mark, and I'm, I'm happy that we're getting that tomorrow because we can look at it and see if there's anything that 
we need to discuss or add or whatever. So uh, thank you for getting that to us tomorrow. The only other thing I have to say is we have Oktoberfest this weekend downtown. It's a very big event, very popular event. It starts Friday, runs through Sunday, and um, I hope you all come out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just want to bring up a few items that some residents have asked me about or brought up to myself around town. Uh, there are the steps that are on Spring Bayou, um, just north of the steps that lead down to the city dock. Um, they're like deteriorating pretty bad, and I think Tom may have already left. So if we'd have someone go check on those and put some new concrete down to make these steps steps again, that would be uh, helpful, I think. Also, Mark, did we have any updates? I know I met with the... Um, some county staff a few months back uh, and talked about the crosswalks on Spring Boulevard and some other parts of the county. Has that had any further con no, conversations? I, I, I talked to uh, town function about that this afternoon. We're going to send uh, a written reminder to the county to ask them. We also want to reiterate in that written reminder to them that, you know, there may be some areas that we'd be willing to partner in. For instance, the intersection is a county road, but maybe it goes on you know, our streets are the side streets. So we want to emphasize not only for them to evaluate and look at those crosswalks, but again, emphasize that if there's partnerships that we can jointly do a lot of these things that we're ready, willing, and able to do. Right now, of course, the county's got the sidewalk project going on on mirrors. Right. Um, they're like us. They've got a ton of projects that are priority, but we are getting, as you can see, the work. If you've gone on mirrors, you see the new sidewalks leading down to the Little League field. Um, they've been working diligently on those. So the county has been one by one coming forward with with projects for and stuff so so um again tom's going to send that written down to him again to remind them that we want to look at these crosswalks and uh also we've got the chief looking at some local crosswalks um him and his traffic people are going to look and that's you know one of the things that's on the list to discuss for for monday about about where we're going to look at and see if we can improve our own local besides the county ones where some of the main intersections of walking um, that we can improve our crosswalks for the walkable community. Yeah, that's an important part, I think, you just hit the nail on the head, is the walkable part of Tarpon Springs. We've got so many residents that, and even people that visit that want to walk. The sponge docks, obviously, walk downtown. How do we pull downtown into Craig Park and walk around the bayou? We want to make it safe. The intersection at Tarpon Ave and the bayou is like, mm -hmm. I, to me, I don't. it seems really dangerous for pedestrians. Um, so if any way we can encourage that would be great. Well, and that's important. I, I think we agreed when we talked to them that we would be taking, because most of that is ours on the one side, so that huh. we would take the initiative <laughs> for, for that particular intersection. So you'll see that coming sooner, because that's probably the first one we're going to do. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I saw in the uh, Public Art Committee uh, minutes I read today that I thought that was a pretty good idea. It, they talked about an uh, art, um, kind of art walk and a crosswalk and how do, they, how do you incorporate art into a crosswalk, and I thought that was pretty neat. So I'm excited to see what that's gonna come, if that comes to fruition or not. Um, a couple things from tonight that came up, I think it would be good to continue to talk about, is parking on the west side of the sponge docks. I know there's some large vacant land in that area. If there's an opportunity for the city to um, not buy the property, but work with a lease, um, of the, of work with the property owner to see if we could somehow lease it over a period of time and put crushed shell or something out there. I don't know what the best idea is or what the cost might be, but I think that is worth looking into um, to try to be respectful to the business owners down there and hopefully bring some additional people down to that side of the sponge docks. Um, also, from a beautification standpoint, I know we've got a uh, meeting on the 22nd, which I'm super excited about. Uh, a lot of these items I've brought up over the past year and a half. Just again, tonight came up with discussion. How do we, the majority of our visitors come to the sponge dock. So how do we make it in a, not necessarily an attraction like a theme park, but how do we continue to keep the character of the sponge docks? So if there's areas that we could maybe buy stone crab traps, um, how do we look at signage at the front of the sponge docks? I know we've mentioned about that and still keep within the history and historic part of the sponge docks. Uh, these are some of the items I'm, I'm looking forward to talking over the next year as well um, to really incorporate the character of the sponge docks. Um, let's see. And then I've also talked to some people that visited the sponge docks from other parts of the area, and they've both, um, they've, 
these individuals have let me know that I, I don't know if you call it hawking or you're trying to sell a boat ride, you're trying to sell a restaurant, you're trying to you're pushing a flyer. Your coach knows them well. Yes. Um, it, it's borderline harassment. Uh, I think is what it sounds like to me, and it sounds like it's not just one person that it's multiple people. And I think we need to be careful as a city on the type of image that we're putting um, into the tourism that visit and the, to the tourists that visit our uh, our sponge dock. So. I think that's a pretty important part to at least keep an eye on. I know, I'm we, sure we you absolutely have been. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, Commissioner Carr, I think some of these things that you brought up, we're going to discuss hopefully on the 22nd because there are things that we've been talking about for a while. And as far as the sponge docks and your comment you just made, that's been ongoing for years and the police department's been on top of it for years. They have certain rights. So we have a difficult time. I don't know if you want to say any more about that, Chief, but I, I know I've been talking about it for as long as I've been down there. <laughs> we, we cited someone down there just this week, but yeah, there, there are some, some logistics we have to work on, but we are on top of it as best we can be. We're down there all the time. Um, you know, we'll continue to be. We're always open to new ideas, so. Thank you. Philip Paris, walking community is something that we'll be trying to accomplish for many years, and uh, I'd like to... Uh, express my uh, appreciation that I see uh, workers that are repairing the uh, sidewalks over in Boulevard. That's going to connect the uh, downtown with the sponge touch. And I see uh, a lot of people that come in, in a positive way. I just want to bring that up to you. Uh, I have some announcements to make that uh, uh, October 20th, the Recreation Department has the uh, truck and trade at the uh, Community Center on Walton Avenue. That begins at 5 p.m. Saturday, October 27 through uh, Sunday, October 28 at the Sponge Ducks, we have the Art and Crafts Show. Thursday, November 1st, the uh, Sunset Beach, and that begins at 7 p.m. And Friday, November 2nd, we have the first Friday on Tarpon Avenue. That begins at 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. I also like to welcome the new businesses, the uh, Athena Creations on Tarpon Avenue. It's a great place to visit and uh, get you uh, Christmas presents. And um, that's all I have. Well, that concludes the regular session meeting, and it's adjourned at 7.59 p.m. Thank you, and good night. It's